Good morning, everyone. A pleasure to be here. Uh, also my first uh, time in Dhaka. Um, I am going to try to give a very broad panoramic overview of the evidence um, on misoprostol for the prevention and treatment for PPH. I'll start by just mentioning something that is probably, there we go, um, not news to any of you, which is why misoprostol? Why do we care? Well, building on the presentations of my colleagues this morning, um, it's clear that the international standard is oxytocin. But I think we also realize that it's a reality that oxytocin remains widely unavailable in many settings, uh, particularly at lower levels of the healthcare system. And misoprostol, which is a drug that's widely available, rather inexpensive as well, um, and easy to use, may have an important role in um, helping us establish uterotonic coverage uh, where women are delivering. Um, and luckily, there's a growing body of what's now become robust evidence on its uh, safety and efficacy with respect to both prevention and treatment. Um, and that's what I'm going to cover now. So I've categorized this into five main scenarios, and these are not scenarios that I've created. These are born out of how it's been studied. Um, oops. It's been studied in the scientific literature, primarily randomized control trials. Um, and these are models that are created to establish safety and efficacy data for each of these. The first one um, is probably the one that most are familiar with, uh, which is it's used for prophylaxis, universal prophylaxis, meaning its administration during the third stage of labor. The second and third um, are related to its use as first-line treatment when PPH is diagnosed um, in two different contexts, one being when a woman has already received prophylaxis in the third stage, and the other being she hasn't received anything and now she has PPH. The fourth is adjunct treatment, meaning the administration of misoprostol simultaneous with or along with um, oxytocin. Um, and then the fifth is sort of a new area that um, we don't have evidence or data on yet, but there's been a lot of discussion and thinking on this, so I'd like to share this very briefly at the end. So really quickly, um, misoprostol for PPH prevention. Well, we have a number of um, community-based RCTs that basically were carried out in multiple settings, including Guinea-Bissau, the Gambia, India, and Pakistan, and um, carried out in somewhat different infrastructures, but mostly at lower levels of the healthcare system, including home births. And I won't go into all the details here, because these have mostly been published, and many of you are probably quite familiar with them, but just to say that the take-home message here is that as a result of these studies, the evidence is quite clear that when you compare the administration of misoprostol to placebo, meaning nothing, um, you, the studies have shown uh, a reduction in, in PPH rates, as well as proportion of women who have drops in hemoglobin, um, and in some cases, severe PPH as well. So now moving on to, well, what about treatment? First-line treatment of, uh, of PPH uh, due to suspected uterine atony. Um, a couple of years ago, these trials were published, and uh, these were two large uh, non-inferiority trials. They were randomized control trials carried out in five countries, uh, Egypt, Burkina Faso, Ecuador, Vietnam, and Turkey. And they sought to basically compare a regimen of 800 micrograms sublingual misoprostol to the gold standard, which is IV oxytocin, here 40 IUs, for the treatment of PPH um, in two contexts. One context is where women had received oxytocin in the third stage of labor, and the second context is where they had not. These were hospital-based studies, since they're large randomized control trials. But just to say that the second one was really intended to be a proxy for what you most commonly find when you move lower in the healthcare system, which is potentially the lack of availability of even oxytocin for the third stage of labor. And in a nutshell, uh, the primary outcome was basically bleeding cessation, active bleeding cessation, and what we find here, so there are two parallel trials, they're not happening at the same hospitals or different sites, um, but quite large. Um, and in the first group you see here on the left is the group that where women had not received uh, oxytocin during the third stage of labor. Um, and then it was, um, you, we have a number of women controlled, and then they were randomized to two treatment. It was a double-blinded treatment, meaning neither the provider nor the women knew what they were giving. Um, Placebo-controlled. 
with 407 women to misoprostol arm and 402. And what you see here is oxytocin uh, performed uh, better. IV oxytocin performed better than misoprostol. Yet, misoprostol did quite well. It stopped bleeding in nine out of 10 of the cases. When we move over to the other arm, which or the other study, I should say, where there was oxytocin given during the third stage of labor, um, what you see is essentially misoprostol and oxytocin IV performed the same. They were comparable uh, with respect to cessation of active bleeding. The other point that I'll just uh, highlight quickly from this study is that while for the many of the side effects there were minimal differences between oxytocin and uh, and misoprostol, there were significant differences with respect to both shivering and fever in both trials. And this is something that's important to note because although none of these were life-threatening in this trial, it's important as part of scale-up and uh, training of programs that providers be trained to know what to anticipate and how to basically manage these uh, side effects that are um, uh, transient and uh, resolve on their own in a matter of time. The fourth scenario is, well, what if I give misoprostol with the oxytocin? Um, and as many of us already know, this is probably what happens in a lot of cases, which is PPH happens and you throw everything you have at it. Well, what the evidence tells us, and the evidence comes primarily from four studies, it, there's really actually no, no uh, benefit in terms of efficacy to doing this but that when you do give the misoprostol, let's say with the oxytocin, what you're getting is more side effects. So this is not something that's advantageous or recommended. Um, so if I could just summarize really quickly the implications before I move on to the next uh, sort of new thinking area, which is that bottom line is, if IV oxytocin is feasible, um, you should use it. Um, we know that from the trial where oxy, where, where no prophylaxis was given, that actually oxytocin performed better than misoprostol. However, when we think about programmatic realities, the same realities that limited the availability of oxytocin for prevention are probably the same realities that would make it also not available for treatment. Um, and in that case, we know that misoprostol will stop bleeding in nine out of 10 cases. Um, and that's where IVs act. We said no benefit to adjunct treatment. As far as last resort, this is one category where there are primarily case studies in the literature, and that is to say it's a last-ditch effort. You're basically throwing everything um, before moving to more invasive procedures. Um, and it's, it's very hard to sort of design studies around this area, but just to say that, that potentially the advantage of doing so may outweigh the risks given the situation in this sense. So we're in a very fortunate place, I think, right now in that we have rather robust clinical safety and efficacy data that are now being translated into uh, programs. But I think it's important that we recognize that there are a number of unanswered questions um, and that you know, there, there are many uh, groups out there that are seeking to answer these questions and hopefully we'll know more in the coming years. Um, and I think a key question that remains uh, and should be highlighted is we don't really know what the impact of these strategies are and we don't know if they save lives. Um, and I think that's sort of important to put out there and, and, and say very frankly, uh, because that has not been evaluated. Um, moving forward and translating clinical science into now programs, we also need to think about program effectiveness, which means not how the medicine works clinically, but how the medicine works in the context of a healthcare system as well. Um, and there are a number of uh, questions, and I've just noted three of them out there, that uh, we are actually conducting uh, community-based trials to assess, including looking at misoprostol versus oxytocin and Uniject, for example, when you get to the lower levels. Because up until now, all the research has been at hospital levels with these two technologies, with, with oxytocin and misoprostol. Additionally, we have hospital data on misoprostol when used for treatment, but we don't know how that fares out in terms of rollout at the lower levels. And research is uh, being rolled out right now in a number of settings to assess this, uh, this model, um, including um, Egypt. And then for the last one, misoprostol, when you use it for both prevention and then you also use it again for treatment, meaning it's the only uterotonic that you have at that point. And that is a question that, again, is, is be, is, will hopefully be answered uh, shortly with research that's being rolled out in both Pakistan and Afghanistan looking at this. Um, 
And I'd like to throw out one more question, which is that we continue to think about sustainability and cost effectiveness as we consider what's an ideal model or an ideal program. Um, and so I think the question has to be, is universal prevention the most cost-effective way to go? It seems to be the most popular route, and many programs have already moved forward with it. But I just sort of want to put this out there, because I think this relates to an issue that was raised in the earlier panel this morning, which is continuum of care. Um, PPH, bleeding postpartum, is a continuous process. It's a continuum. Um, and the dichotomy of prevention versus treatment are ones that have been created primarily by how it's been studied and interventions have been shaped. But let's say, for example, that you were, well, let's start with the right, with intervention two, actually. You've had 1,000 deliveries. And this, I would say, is a theoretical model because it uses hospital-based data. Um, but I did use the incidence rates of PPH that are derived from the India study, which is a community-based trial looking at misoprostol versus nothing. So let's say you chose to do a rollout of misoprostol for PPH prevention. You have 1,000 deliveries, and you're going to give every single one of these women universal prophylaxis, meaning three pills to take orally. That's 3,000 pills. The anticipated expected there is that you'd get about a risk rate of 6% for PPH, meaning you'd have 60 cases that you needed to do something about. So the question I ask is, what's happening with those 60 cases? How are we addressing continuum of care because those 60 cases are critical? On the flip side, if you said, well, what if I focus my resources and energies on addressing this via the treatment route, treating as needed? So you had the same thousand deliveries. We know that if you don't give anything, you'd have a rate of 12%, which is double what you would have with misoprostol, let's say, based on the India results. If you gave a sublingual 800 dose, four pills, to those 120 women, you'd have administered 400 pills. Based on the results we know from the hospital settings, nine out of 10 women would have bleeding controlled, meaning 108, and now 12 women would need additional inter intervention. Again, this is theoretical, but I think important to consider. Um, and the one thing that I will say is when we started to discuss this with policymakers, a common question or common response is, that's great. The problem is, is PPH is diagnosed so late that I'm very concerned about this. And that's what's led into some of this newer thinking, which is maybe we need to be thinking about how we combine the knowledge that we know and think beyond these dichotomous prevention and treatment strategies into hybrid strategies, meaning secondary prevention, early treatment, liberal treatment. It's been renamed a million times. I'm sure you can probably provide additional suggestions. Um, but the premise of this is to say, if, you know, if we know that nine out of 10 women who get prophylaxis don't need it, and we know that PPH is happening along a continuum, and in fact, provider practices are, because many of the research, uh, many of the research studies that are out there when you look at the timing of when the, actually the uterotonic is given, many of them are given so late that it's no longer really a third stage of labor prophylaxis. It's actually given as a sort of a preemptive treatment. And this is very common when you start to see what providers are actually doing because they are managing PPH along that continuum. And so if we have this safe and effective dose of 800 microgram, what if we overtreat it? What if you gave it to more women that need it by saying, well, we looked at the data and we know that the upper quartile, which is 25% of women are expected to, let's say, bleed 350 mLs or more. That's not PPH. It's 350 mLs, more or less. But if you treated one in four women, you would include that group that would eventually have gone on to have PPH. Um, and you'd be over-treating, essentially, by double what I showed in the previous slide, which is about 12% with no prophylaxis. The potential advantage of a of a model like this is that you're not giving the drug to every single woman, so you're medicating fewer women, exposing fewer women to side effects, and also potentially reducing costs. Um, this is something that we are currently looking uh, to, uh, uh, to understand more about. There are community-based trials, randomized controlled trials, that are being carried out in India, uh, which is already enrolling, and one that's planned in Egypt for later this year, that will attempt to compare primary uh, prevention prophylaxis with this model of secondary prevention early treatment. Thank you very much.